It is really great to be here. You mentioned I was at the Kennedy School, so I, I like to date myself by, um, people ask, where are you from? DC, well, I'm originally from LA, but DC, um, you know, how long have you been there? Well, I co-wrote a book on the Reagan administration. That's how long it's been. Um, I did escape over those many years a few times, a year in Japan, uh, but my, one of my best years was uh, in Cambridge when I was a fellow at the Kennedy School and my husband and his company were swallowed up by the Mitt Romney campaign for a year. Um, it was, but it was great and I have, uh, my heart really goes out to this part of the country and as Steve was reminding me, um, Lawrence is, I mean Lowell, I'm sorry, is such a you know, like vibrant economy and vibrant place and there's so much interesting uh, innovative companies going on, going on here and, and as, um, as Jack just pointed out too, I mean, it, don't take this lightly. I mean, to start the courage it takes to start a bank, the courage it starts to start to start a bank and then to survive through financial crisis and the ups and downs. And I mean, congratulations. That is truly, truly a uh, a feat. I come from the world of fortune. I love companies. Um, I love companies. I love entrepreneurs. I love companies that thrive. But this is about politics. And at the end of the day, I think you guys are going to be able to tell me a lot, um, ba actually based on the Lowell economic experience. So we're, we'll get to that at the end. But I first wanted to get a show of hands. How many of you think this country is hopelessly divided? Like, you can't talk about politics at the dinner table. And how many of you think it's only going to get worse? OK, how many think it's going to get better? Okay, I love the optimists in the room. <laughs> so that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, because I think a lot of the hopelessness you feel in this room is well grounded. Um, but I wanted to point out that we've been here before, many times in our country's history. Division and rancor and downright ugliness, those are traits that have always always pockmark the political history of this experiment in democracy that we call the United States of America. The comforting news is that this is nothing new in American political history, even going back to our nation's founding fathers. Here's what Thomas Jefferson's political operatives, and in those days he didn't throw the mud himself, his political operatives did it, but here's what he had to say about then President Adams. He has a hideous, hermaphroditical character. He has neither the force and firmness of a man, nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. OK, now, doesn't that trump Melissa McCarthy's castrating impersonation of Sean Spicer? I mean, really? Um, so Adams wasn't one to sit back and um, take it. So his operatives responded that Thomas Jefferson was a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw squired by a Virginia mulatto father. OK. OK, the kind of racism that would actually fit into a 140-character tweet. <laughs> and let's not forget Alexander's enemies, who dismissed him as, and all of us who love the show can quote it, a bastard, an orphan, and the son of a whore. Who's seen, it? Who's seen Hamilton? Isn't that the best? Oh my gosh, you guys have to go see Hamilton. I mean, it's life changing. It'll change your kids' lives. It's great. It's a great, great play. Um, and then let's not forget that dual thing. Okay? Now, now keep the, keep, like, put this in perspective. You have a sitting vice president of the United States murdering in cold blood the nation's first treasury secretary. Wow. Half a century later, later, mind you, things weren't much better. That was when a sitting member of the US House of Representatives, his name is Preston Brooks, he crossed the US Capitol, stepped into the Senate chamber, and repeatedly beat Senator Charles Sumner over the head with a metal cane until he fell down unconscious. Sumner's sin was mocking Brooks's South Carolina senators uh, over the issue of slavery. So, Inane tweets from the President of the United States, let's just say we've kind of been there before. Um, but we've always been a nation to pull past that rancor. 
I've always believed, I'm, I'm a real optimist about this country, I believe in this country. Um, I've always seen us as a nation of hope and optimism, a trait that early on with our founders, I mean, keep in mind that's what set us starkly apart from old Europe, if you've ever done um, planning of conferences as I have with some old European friends. Uh, they can't stand our exuberance and optimism. It really is part of our DNA. We're also a nation of inclusion and innova innovation. But that said, I agree. Today's deep divisions are indeed troublesome. Um, and a lot, I mean, they're troublesome on a lot of levels, but especially because we have dire problems that need to be addressed. Um, and division in Washington has meant paralysis. And it's been going on for some time. Um, in fact, my longtime role at Fortune, particularly uh, as I plan conferences of Fortune 500 CEOs, it puts me in touch with a lot of Silicon Valley types, and I guess here I should say, and Silicon Valley East types. Um, and of course, you know, if you're a business um, leader in Silicon Valley, you like to extol the virtues of dynamic disruption, right? That term is all the rage. That's what you're all about, upending staid business models with cooler, new, transformative technologies, dynamic disruption. Because I've lived in Washington the better part of three decades, um, written books about it, um, I have to remind my Silicon Valley friends that I live in a different valley. It's the valley of dynamic dysfunction. And today, that dysfunction is at pitch levels. A few months ago, um, moderate Republican Senator Charlie Dent of Pennsylvania announced his decision to retire with words that really resonate. Um, he complained about growing isolationist, nativist, and protectionist trends, at, at times nihilistic trends that are unsettling. They infect both political parties. And I would argue that that plays out in the paralysis that we're seeing on Capitol Hill. Um, but it predates today. I mean, I, I remember giving speeches pre this administration and joking that it felt like Groundhog Day, the same politicized fights over and over and over, you know, shutting down the government, not getting an education bill, not getting an immigration bill. Immigration bill, you know, let's take immigration reform that would bring 12 million undocumented workers online into the economy. That's not been done. That was proposed by George... W. Bush. Entitlement reform that would save Medicare and Social Security and disability benefits for future generations, that was not even in the Trump budget. Infrastructure spending that would position us at the forefront of a changing global economy, which should have been, in my mind, um, the first thing the Trump administration did, but it wasn't, and that now that's way on the back burner. It would have been a great bipartisan move. And of course, there's hope for tax reform, um, which would, I think, give a a well-needed boost to businesses, and small businesses like mine. Um, but the escalation of a Republican civil war, fu fueled by the populist Trump wing, um, means that that's going to be an uphill battle. So every period of rancorous division in American history has underlying roots. And of course, in the 60s, it was a war. It was a war that took 50,000 lives. It was a draft. Um, it was young Americans dying. Today, I'd argue that what underlines um, our deep divisions are economic issues, economic pain. And specifically, I would call it economic populism, fueled by Americans already left behind by globalization and knowledge economy, but then, then getting kicked in the gut by the Great Recession and never recovering. Eight years after an economic collapse grew out of the residential real estate market and spread through Wall Street and consumed our economy, it wasn't that long ago, but there remains tremendous anxiety and anger and a lot of economic pain and loss. And I saw this going into last year's election. So let me read you just three headlines that appeared just as the 2016 presidential election cycle was kicking into high gear. This was from Fortune in December 2015. The middle class no longer the majority. America's middle class falls below 50%. Now, think about that for a minute. Middle class Americans, who are the engine of this country in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, 
now comprise less than half of us. The middle class is no longer most of us. Now, for a lot of people, that's great news. There's lots of winners in the iPhone economy, um, and they've joined the vaunted top 1%, but a lot more have fallen down the economic ladder. Headline number two, the myth of US manufacturing renaissance. In the 2000s, with the rise of China, automation, and a growing globalization, our nation's manufacturing sector lost 5.8 million jobs, or about one-third of its workforce. And that's pretty astonishing, since manufacturing jobs used to provide a solid middle-class employment for the non-college educated. As that he headline suggests, though, that's not the case anymore. One study found that average manufacturing worker wages declined 9% from 1973 to 2005, even as the US economy grew by 200%. It's pretty astonishing. So let me go on to read another headline from, going into, from that period going into the 2016 election. Middle-aged whites in America dying at startling rates. The mortality rate for white men and women ages 45 to 54 without a college degree increased markedly between 1999 and 2013. So just think about that. An industrialized nation where middle-aged mortality among whites, supposedly the top of the ethnic food chain, right, is actually increasing. What's behind it? Drug addiction alcohol, depression, suicide, a lot of desperation. And by now, of course, we've all heard about the opioid crisis with addiction and overdose rates that are just consuming ERs around the country. And of course, here, you've got New Hampshire, um, a state of just 1.3 million people, 500 died last year of overdoses. And first responders are increasingly expected to bring people back from the brink of death. So that brings up this next startling headline going into last year's election. Death predicts whether people vote for Donald Trump. This is in the Washington Post. So the Washington Post did a deep dive look on voting data in counties and broke them down um, uh, for looking at who voted for what candidate. And they found that Trump performed best in places where middle-aged whites were actually dying the fastest. So this is where we come to the phenomenon the media only discovered last year, or the, you know, with the me meteoric ride of, rise of Donald Trump. And that's, of course, the plight of the so-called white working class. Now, in my mind, that's a misnomer. Um, we're not talking about working class, just working class, blue collar people who work in factories. Um, we're talking, the real category to look at is whites without a college degree. Folks who have a high school education or less, um, who might have a few years of community college, a couple, couple college classes under their belt. Um, and the range, they, the range of jobs that they're in is vast, from truck drivers and builders, but to cashiers and store managers. It's a lot of people. Um, of course, in this room, I'm sure you're all focused on millennials and their purchasing power, but actually, non-college educated whites are America's largest demographic group. What percent, I usually ask this of smaller groups, but I'm gonna ask you guys, throw out a number, what percent of adult Americans do you think have a bachelor's degree? 20, 20. did I hear 20? 20, 20. oh, you guys are, hmm? 25, it's like 25 to 30. It, most people don't, I, you guys are sophisticated, most people don't know that. That means like most people don't have a college education. Um, 51 million white adults have at least a bachelor's degree, but nine million white adults don't. So think about that. And that college degree as expensive as we all know from our kids and people's kids, um, as expensive as that college degree is today, it still confers a substantial income advantage to Americans. 
Um, it offers a buffer against unemployment. I'm sure you saw the numbers during the Great Recession when unemployment rates for those with a college degree were much lower than those without. Um, and without that degree, workers are being left behind increasingly in, in this fast-changing knowledge economy. I'm spilling my water here. Um, those. So a lot of people, a lot of those people without college degrees are dropping out of the workforce by the millions and often turning to disability insurance to support themselves. We have now have generations of white families, often broken families, living off disability checks and addicted to opioids. Disability spending has skyrocketed. And I've always, I, I picked this up and was writing about it in columns years ago. I don't consider it a budget issue. I consider it a what it does to human beings issue. When you get a disability check um, and you're able to get them because they've uh, expanded the definition of chronic pain, the, like, the definitions of mental illness, and it's not a big check. You're not getting rich off of this. But what it does is it gets you by and prevents you from getting on that escalator in a job that would get you out of poverty. It's basically, it's, it's like a ghetto of poverty. Um, but the, the numbers of people collecting disability checks has skyrocketed. This year, the US will spend more money on disability benefits than food stamps. A Washington Post investigation of 102 Rust Belt counties found one in six working age residents drawing disability checks. The rate at which white men of prime working age and again, that's age 25 to 54, the rate at which they're dropping out of the workforce is astonishing and historically unprecedented. And yet, six million jobs in this country remain vacant. When the monthly jobs report comes out and you hear about our low labor participation rates and how that's um, keeping down economic growth, this is one reason. There's millions of prime age white men unable or unwilling to, report, to return to the workforce. And often, they're, they're not getting married and form, or they're not forming stable families that, as we know, create vibrant, healthy communities. Among this population, marriage rates are far lower than certainly all of you in this room. How many of you read, or have read, have read about Hillbilly Elegy, the book? Um, if you haven't read it, I really highly encourage you to read it. Read, um, written by J.D. Vance, um, Yale-trained lawyer, uh, who probably run for office one day, um, but he grew up in Appalachia culture in Kentucky and Ohio and tells the story of his life. There's an incredible moment in this telling of this story in which his mother, who's a nurse, um, is demanding her 14-year-old son, JD, uh, urinate in a cup so that she can pass her drug test to get her nursing certificate. I mean, that's like what he was growing up in. He escaped it. Um, and when he read Daniel Patrick Moynihan's famous 1965 report, I don't know if you all remember that, about the breakdown of um, black families in America and how that was going to create a, a cycle of um, pathologies and so on, he said, wait, that's my community. That's my family. So what does this mean politically? Um, for one thing, we have now have numbers showing that Hillary Clinton's loss in decisive battleground states had a lot to do with the fact that a quarter of working class whites, non-college educated whites, who voted for Obama switched and voted for Trump. Um, we now have to think about the political divides very differently. The big new divide is educational attainment, whether or not you have a college degree. It's geographic, too. It tends to be rural versus urban, towns versus cities, far-flung suburbs versus close-in suburbs. For example, if you were in London, as I was, when Brexit, when the Brexit vote happened, um, although I was right on it, um, but if you mo were most people in London, you didn't see Brexit coming. Just like if you were in New York and Washington, you probably wrote off Donald Trump. The rural versus urban split is fairly astonishing given past trends. So when you think about it, remember in the 70s and 80s, the nation's basket cases were the cities, right? Um, the crack, remember the crack epidemic, drugs, suburban flight? Well, 
In 2017, the big drug, drug epidemic, of course, is heroin and opioids, and the epi epicenter is small town America. And then on the other side, and this is not to say that cities are perfect and they don't have a lot of problems still, nevertheless, cities have become the magnet for the knowledge economy. Um, you have more desirable high wage jobs. Suburban flight, I like to joke, is now means flight to downtown. Uh, it's funny, I just went to the wedding shower of a friend of mine. She's the youngest woman ever elected to Congress uh, from New York, and, uh, but it was in DC. It was outside the Washington National Stadium, and it was in what's called the Navy Yards, and it, it used to be the kind of place you would, just vacant lots, drug deals, murders, you would never go there, ever. And now it's teeming with um, you know, well-paid millennials happily peddling their rideshare bikes along the waterfront. It's high-priced condos and shopping at Harris Teeters and eating truffles on burgers. I mean, and I see this all over America, even in places like Detroit. And of course, you've seen it here. Contrast that with rural white America, which the Wall Street Journal just labeled America's new inner city. Drugs, crime, family breakdown, joblessness, and hopelessness. And that hopelessness is captured in this amazing statistic. American blacks and Hispanics are actually more optimistic about the US economy than their white counterparts. They're more likely to see better days ahead for themselves than whites without college degrees. In fact, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians were far less likely than whites to say that America's best days are behind us. The plight of small town America is something we should care about and we should be looking for ways to help. Instead, I have to say the liberal reaction's been pretty dismissive, not, not by everybody, but you know, Hillary Clinton labeling Trump voters the deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, you name it. Um, that probably isn't helpful. Uh, and then, of course, President Obama set the stage for that with his 2008 remarks about small towners who are bitter, clinging to guns and religious, and antipathy towards people who aren't like them. Um, and Democrats wonder why they lose the white working class vote that they once so happily held on to. So here's what we all, I think, need to acknowledge, um, is that there is economic pain from globalization and more importantly, from technological change. And it's breeding economic populism. There's real anger and distrust of elites who've embraced that technological revolution and a global economy and have dismissed their concerns. Let's not forget, too, um, there's a related breed of populism on the left. Let's not forget the surprise popularity of Bernie Sanders last year, whose sole message was anger at the top 1% of us. Let's not for get that he almost stole the election from Hillary Clinton. And let's not forget how Clinton shamelessly tried to bask in Bernie's populist glow by attacking Wall Street and throwing the trade agreement, the TPP trade agreement, under the bus, despite President Obama's pleas. So we've got economic populism swirling on the right and the left. And with it, I think, there's this breakdown of political trust, especially a distrust of elites, me, you guys, business elites, political elites, media elites. Um, and in Washington, these elites have a nasty habit of compromising. And today's populists, who are emboldened by their own opinions funneled through social media, make compromise really difficult. And that makes governing really nearly impossible. And so we have Groundhog Day with our nation's severe problems left unsolved. Former Trump strategist, and Goldman Sachs banker, Stephen Bannon, is brilliant at capitalizing on these fault lines. So he's trying to marginalize voices like Senator Corker and Flake, who believe in America as a leader in the world and a world that is part of a fast-changing global economy. That's what we're going to see in 2018. We're going to see, and we could talk about this more in the question and answer session, we're going to see um, Steve Bannon trying to primary uh, sitting senators who he thinks are part of the establishment. But here's the thing, if we look beyond the election cycles, which is what I'm trying to do in this talk, 
Um, there's real risk that the plight of non-college educated whites will actually only get worse and the Bannon voice will only get louder. Not necessarily bigger, because we've got a demographic change going on here um, um, with, with whites becoming a minority, um, particularly in the millennial generation, which is half white, half non-white, but, but it'll be louder. Um, and that, in my mind, is because of a coming disruption to the American workplaces in the next 20 years. I shouldn't even say coming, it's, it's already arrived. Um, we're part of, right now, we're really in this fourth industrial revolution with technological change that's coming at us at a pace, literally a pace unprecedented in human history. The rise of AI, automation, machine learning, robotics. It's all, a, a lot of it, it's about the displacement of humans. Just look around. Um, when I talk to CEOs, I interview a lot of CEOs on stage these days, they love to talk about autonomous mobility. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. I interviewed the CIO of Boeing, and he, ta he was talking about um, having pilotless planes. I said, you mean like really with nobody even like in the cockpit? Wouldn't you just, I, and I, said, I said, wouldn't you have a pilot in the cockpit at least overseeing the plane? And he said, that's one scenario. <laughs> okay. So pilotless planes, so from air travel to deliveries to cars, pilotless cockpits, package deliveries by drones, Uberless, um, driverless Uber cars, and even GM is now big. Mary Barra just announced she's developing a robo-taxi. Then you have advanced manufacturing, which means that factories that once employed tens of thousands now employ a thousand or two at most. I had this experience during the, really during the depth of the recession. I visited a VW plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it was incredibly powerful because here were all these men and women, working class, being trained for these great jobs. VW had, like, despite the recession, was sticking with this plant. We're bringing everybody um, in and, and, and creating cars and showing that America can actually continue with manufacturing. But here's the thing. There was only 2,000 workers in that plant. You know, in the day, in the 60s, 70s, it would have been 10,000 workers. Um, somebody smartly said, a decade ago, industrial robots assisted workers in their tasks. Now workers will be assisting robots. And by the way, this is an international trend. I don't know if you noticed this week, but Saudi Arabia just announced, the new crown prince there announced a, um, a new city he's building. And it will have more robots than humans. China where I'm, by the way, I'm co-chairing a, a Fortune Global Forum in Guangzhou, China, um, this coming December with, with CEOs and government officials, but they're engaged in this major push to automate manufacturing in order to lower labor costs. So you have to wonder with this regime that's incredibly worried about political unrest, what is going to happen as those workers get displaced by automation and robotics? And in this country, you know, we, we, we're all seeing self-serve kiosks in airports and drugstores and fast food places. McDonald's is deploying a digital ordering kiosk now. These are places where folks who didn't have college degrees went to work. And as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, it even extends to financial services. Um, I was told about an uh, a AI program that replaces loan officers and fills out the loan application so that the loan officer doesn't have to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> most CEOs I know put a very happy face on all of this. They argue that, well, it's going to free people from difficult physical tasks. It's going to free people to do more, more fulfilling work, it's, which is it's all true. Um, the CEO of Deloitte argues that autonomous vehicles will prompt gains in efficiency and productivity, leaving consumers with more surplus income to spend on other goods and services, and that will expand the economy. Um, she argues that the emergence of driverless trucks will be a boon for transportation, um, transportation costs, and transportation which is facing a shortage, chronic shortage of drivers. And then economists note that productivity growth in digital industries like technology, communications, media and software, and finance is actually robust, while economic growth 
where it's been held back and physical industries slow to adapt new technologies like healthcare, transportation, education, manufacturing, retail, um, it's, it's slower. So they make, this, they make these points, these are great points, but in the short run especially, there's gonna be winners and there's gonna be losers. And a lot of jobs are gonna be displaced. Dri let's take driverless trucks, since these are high, this is, this is coming, I tell you, I talk to these company executives, this is mobile, uh, autonomous mobility is really mostly what they're talking about, that and AI. Um, driverless trucks are high on that to-do list, um, but there's two million long haul truck drivers in this country. Who are they? Mostly my, white men without college degrees. A study by, of course, all the best studies come out of Boston. So Boston, I, I, I used to cite their studies all the time. Some of my favorite economists are there. But a study by Boston University and MIT found that in, from 1990 to 2007, locations with the highest concentrations of robotics were experiencing the worst declines in jobs and wages. So it's not like we've run out of jobs or run out of work, and as I said before, and as Ivanka Trump, I interviewed her at our Fortune Most Powerful Women's Summit a couple weeks ago, and she's pointing out, you know, there's six million vacancies, job vacancies, um, but we're facing this growing population of people who can't necessarily, aren't skilled enough to fulfill, or to fill those jobs, and possibly can't make a reasonable living based on the skills and education that they have. Even factories are demanding more and more of their workers have college degrees so that they can run automated, complicated manufacturing. And remember all those job commitments that Detroit automakers promised newly elected Donald Trump? A new study shows automakers are actually making cuts to their American workforces that outpace those job commitments. So I think employers have to be mindful of training those workers for more interesting higher end work instead of eliminating their jobs. And this is where I see you all, and I'd love to hear more about your experience here because you could, I, I just, it sounds like you're the shining example on the hill of a community that used to be working class in Milltown and now um, you've got a stellar communi community college, you've got, um, incubators, you've got, you are, you are doing it right. And I know you have the advantage of being connected to Boston, but um, it's still, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, Steve, what you guys are doing. Um, and I, I think the, I would just leave you with this, is that you need to be thought leaders on this, because we need a workforce equipped for the future, and we need sponsors to help people get there. We need more apprentice programs for the non-college bound, we need more companies to partner with community colleges to build relevant skills. We need to teach our kids and other people's kids not just things to know, but critical thinking because they need to continuously learn throughout their careers. Um, education is really, a, we've got to teach education as this lifelong skill. Um, we can't end with 22-year-olds, 21-year-olds walking down wearing their cap and gowns and with, it, with a diploma, even if you have a diploma. Uh, we've got to rethink how we, how we talk about uh, skills and training and education to keep our workforce better equipped for these fast-paced changes. We need to constantly help our workers retool, reskill, and retrain. And we need you as thought leaders to, I think, you know, you, especially coming from where you're coming from in this area, you need to challenge the politicians here. Um, you need to challenge. Uh, you need to challenge people running for office. You need to find ways to showcase what you've done here to other communities who are deeply suffering. Um, just some other ideas. Bill Gates has proposed a robot tax to fund worker training. Not a bad idea. At, at least you know it's a start of a conversation about how you retrain workers. There's uh, in the heart of Appalachia. There's a program actually afoot to teach Kentucky coal miners computer coding. So imagine that, you know, thinking about teaching young people in that could have been Kentucky coal miners how to, how to code. If we don't force our business and policy leaders to think and act outside the box, I'm, I'm convinced we're gonna see this double down effect on 
the economic populism that I've been talking about. We're gonna see our political system in pain, even worse pain than we are now. Um, and we're gonna, because Americans are gonna be left behind in this economy. But here's the thing, despite being part of Washington politics for more than um, almost four decades, I'm an optimist. Um, I covered the run on savings and loans back in the late 80s. I was there reporting on Hank Paulson as he raced back and forth between Capitol Hill trying to keep the banks from collapsing and our economy from collapsing out from under us. Um, those were pretty scary times, but since then there's been incredible optimism. You look at the stock market, you look how companies are doing, you look how your bank is doing. Um, in 2009, conventional wisdom declared the United States was a loser. I don't know if you remember this, but right after 2009, it was gonna be all about China. We were, we were crushed, it was all about China. Well, in fact, we clean, our banks cleaned themselves up faster than the European banks. And China, while continuing with its a subsidized economy um, to grow, um, the US is the best performing major economy in the developed world. We are by far the most innovative economy in the world. And China, as we know, wants to send their best and brightest to our universities and colleges. So when I look at America, I don't see carnage. I don't see a mess. I see political institutions that are slow and too often politicized and are certainly strained. But those same institutions are awfully good at checks and balances. And it's really messy, but on the big stuff, it seems to be working. And I want to hear from you now. I want to hear your examples and experiences and thoughts. Um, so for now, I'll stop with the, that great comment from my great hero, Winston Churchill. Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried. <laughs> Thank you.